Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you a technique to etch silicon wafers to make optical filters. These are the same wafers that are used to make integrated circuits, but in today's experiment, we're going to use an acid bath and an electrical current to make these specialized optical rugate filters. These filters have a lot of interesting properties. The surface can even be functional, so we can use it as a chemical sensor. We can pattern the sensor using light, and we can even remove the filter from the surface of the silicon just by giving it a high current pulse and then actually make a transparent filter. Uh, but this actually has one other property that's a true, a true mind blower. Let me show you. So say we take this green filter here and put it under the spectrometer, which we will later on, we would see that it's very peaky. So it basically has almost no blue response and then there's a huge spike in green and then there's not much red. Um, by the nature of this Rugate filter, we end up with a very spiky response. And if we take the inverse Fourier transform of this, we end up with a wavelength of about the same frequency, right? And so the frequency corresponds to this one spike. Basically, if, you know, different wavelengths for different colors, it's basically one color, one wavelength. This is actually the electrical waveform that I used to create that filter. And if we wanted a red one, it would be almost the same thing, spike it red, and then we would end up with a longer wavelength for red. And that's exactly what I did to do this. And what's cool is that this actually works for any spectral response you want. You could draw something completely arbitrary, you know, a lot of blue, and then it's down, and then there's a spike, and then it's back up again. Anything you can draw, take the Fourier transform, and then that waveform becomes what we use to create the filter. So this is a really cool technique. Um, that gives you a tremendous amount of power over what you want to create, you know, spectrally. But here's the real mind blow. It's not like a photon is coming in and it says, oh, well, looks like a Rugate filter, better use the Fourier method. No, no, this applies to basically all interactions between light and a change in index of refraction. And so in today's video, we'll take a look at even the lowly anti-reflection coding and see how the math basically ties all this together. So just to put some numbers on this, this waveform has a period of about, you know, two or three seconds, which then gets converted into a spatial waveform by this silicon etching process where the period is on the order of hundreds of nanometers, which is convenient because then it interacts with visible light like this. And um, you'll see some similarities to like anodizing titanium, where you can control the color of the titanium by anodizing it and creating a, a layer. And that's, we'll take a look at that too. That's similar to a uh, that's similar to a single coating like this. But the difference here is that the waveform actually controls the index of refraction as we're etching the silicon. I can't think of any other material that does this. Um, so we'll see, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, also, this entire project was inspired by a viewer suggestion. So thank you so much, Ian, for suggesting this. This turned out to be a tremendous journey into how math ties together spatial and frequency and temporal and it, it, it's really quite a thing. So um, pull up a chair and let's take a look at some optical coatings. I'm going to say index a lot in this video and what I mean is the index of optical refraction. So there's this oldie but goodie experiment where you take a magnifying glass and it looks fine in air but when we dip it in oil it doesn't really function as a magnifying glass anymore. And the reason for this is that you know, the index of optical refraction describes how fast light travels in a material. So an index of two means that light only goes half as fast as it would in a vacuum. And a consequence of this change in speed of light in a material is that at the junction where the index changes, uh, some of the light is reflected. And if the surface is at an angle, some of the light uh, gets bent um, or is refracted. So let me show you. Here's the container of oil with the lens in profile view, and both the oil and the lens have an index somewhere between one and two, like most materials you'll encounter. And air has an index pretty close to one, but not exactly. So when the light ray in air comes in, when it hits that junction between air of index one and the lens of index, let's just say two, it gets bent here because the lens has curvature, and there's also a reflection a reflection. Okay, the marker just died. But anyway, this is a unfortunate consequence, but it means that we can see transparent objects because there's an index change and we can see the reflection. 
However, the story is different in oil. If there were perfect matching between the oil and the lens, there shall be no bending of light here and also no reflection, absolutely zero, totally transparent. The light doesn't know that anything happened. The light ray just goes completely all the way through. So to be more precise, the container itself is made of a different material, plastic, for example, but just for uh, demonstration, we'll also consider the material to have the same index as the oil. And then also, the light ray that comes into here still is going to reflect because we're, it's, there's air outside this container. And when it hits the wall, even though it's flat here, there's no bending of light, but there will still be a reflection. So light that goes in straight will bounce back out straight. And I mentioned that most materials have an index between one and two. Uh, you can find materials that have an index between two and three, although they're considered fairly rare. And there's a really interesting outlier. Germanium has an index of four, which is, I think, the highest of all materials. The only trouble is that germanium is not transparent to visible wavelengths, but it is transparent to medium and far infrared, which is why they use this as lenses on thermal cameras. If you're an optical lens designer, you generally want to use high index materials because it bends the light more. And so you can achieve more optical work with fewer elements because you can bend the light rays more severely. The downside is that high index materials also reflect more. So you have to deal with the reflections. Um, for an index of two in air, the reflection is about 5%, which doesn't sound too bad, but in a nice big camera lens like this, there could be 10 or 20 interfaces to deal with. So 0.95 to the 10 or 20 power is pretty bad. You're losing like half the light just to reflections. So we need to figure out a way to deal with these reflections. We know that light has a wave-like nature, and we also know that whenever it hits an interface, a difference between index of refraction, we get a reflection. So we can use these two facts to build an anti-reflection coating. But first, let's take a look at the basic system. So we've got air up here, glass down here, and the light, the light uh, comes in, and we get a 5% reflection and a 95% transmission. And then this graph over here just shows the index of refraction over space in the direction that light is traveling. So we start out up here, there's no change, there's no change, and then right when we hit the interface, there's a big step change, but then once we're into the new material, there's no more change again. So we'll just keep track of that over here. Now, a basic anti-reflection coating works by canceling out the wave that we get from this first surface. So we still get the same 5% reflection because the light doesn't know what's ahead of it. It's still gonna reflect 5% off that first surface. But then the light goes through that first surface and hits the second surface, which is spaced at an exactly perfect distance away, such that the wave that comes off that second surface perfectly cancels the reflection. Um, the distance between the first and second surface has to be a quarter wavelength so that the total optical path length is 180 degrees. Or in other words, it cancels out the wave because they're 180 degrees offset. Great. And if we look at the graph here, we have the step change going into the coating and then another step change from the coating into the glass. And then again, once we're in the glass, no more changes. So we know the coating has to be a quarter wavelength to get this 180 degree canceling. But what about the index? What should the index of the coating be? The way that we determine that is knowing that the reflection from the first surface is about 5%. So for a index two lens in air, that reflection is 5%. And the thing that determines what index the coating should be is how intense this 180 degree canceling waveform should be. Obviously we don't want to over or under correct it. We know the, the thickness has to be fixed due to the wavelength, but we could turn the intensity up and down of this 180 degree uh, you know, correction wave by, by adjusting the index here. And as it turns out, in air, it's the square root of the material that you're coating. So if the lens is two, you want it to be square root two to get a perfect 5% reflection at a perfect wavelength. One question is, where does the energy go? If we're canceling out these two waves, we can't just get rid of the energy. And in the ideal sense, none of these materials can absorb anything. So where can it go? Well, the only answer is it's transmitted. So an anti-reflection coating is actually a pro-transmission coating. 
So the fact that we're canceling these two waves out means the energy really has to be transmitted. There's nowhere else for it to go. And this means that the spectrum of light, the colors that get through the lens are slightly affected by this anti-reflection coating. Remember, everything that's not reflected must be transmitted in the ideal sense. So let's check this out. We'll take our single coated lens over to the spectrometer and I'm using a tungsten light source because it's broadband and uh, easy to use. And we will aim the spectrometer at the coating so we can get a sense of it. And yeah, sure enough, it cancels out very well. The spectral response shows that right at green, right at about 550 nanometers, we're getting much less reflection than we are elsewhere in the spectrum. So we essentially have like a one frequency filter. This is why single coated lenses have a purplish cast to them. The green has been removed, but there's actually more red and blue light in the reflection, which gives them that purple color. Now, if we take this change in index over space graph and plug it into Desmos, which is an online mathematical tool, and I'll put links to all this stuff in the description, and we take the Fourier transform of this, we actually see the same response that we saw with the spectrometer. So we can see it's a nice smooth, sloping response with a, a low point right in the middle of the spectrum. And don't worry about the units, this is just to get the concept across. Uh, but things to notice are that the response is very smooth. So if we have a wavelength that's close to green but not quite, it will also have this anti-reflection coating effect applied to it. And that's because with this 180 degree shift, if we're close, we still get some of the effect. Whereas if we're way off, then we get no effect. And if we're really far off, then we actually get the effect again if we're at a multiple of the wavelength. So now let's kick it up a notch. As technology got better, um, there was the desire to make better anti-reflection coatings. And instead of correcting just one wavelength, we can correct two with just one layer addition. So now we have air up here, the first layer, the second layer, and then glass. And we space these out so that we have one wavelength for this first layer and a different wavelength for this next layer. And the exact indices here, again, I'll link to the exact numbers, but there is an optimum set for these two. Works the same way. We still get that original 5% full reflection, and then we get a reflection for the first wavelength and another reflection for the second wavelength. And if we get the plot, we now have two frequencies in this, well, two spots where we get a reflection in this graph. And sure enough, if we look at a green multi-coated lens uh, with the spectrometer, we see that it has this double dip pattern where there's two frequencies that have anti-reflection properties. And sure enough, if we plug this back into the mathematical program, it has exactly the same shape to that, um, to that response. And it looks greenish because there is in fact less red and less uh, blue light compared to green in this case, because now we're correcting frequencies in the red and blue area, but we're not targeting green this time. So a little bit more green comes through. And so in, in designing high quality camera lenses, uh, people talk about color rendition. And so figuring out your coatings and mixing and matching them such that the total spectrum that gets through is true to reality and has a high, you know, a good aesthetic quality is an important thing of lens design. Let's go back to this graph for a minute. What is the Fourier transform of this one bar right at zero? It's actually a flat line. And this is great because it means that this reflection doesn't have any spectral dependence. And so we've been thinking about this graph over here as being a change in index over distance. But we can also think about this as sort of the frequency dependence of the spectral response, right? So if we have all of our energy at zero frequency, that's DC. And that means that's right, because if we just have a piece of glass, the reflection that we get off of it has all the colors in it. It's not an anti-reflection coating. It has no color to the reflection. Whereas down here, at green, this is an anti-reflection coating signified by this some amount of energy of this of, of frequency out in this frequency domain. But at certain other wavelengths, it's an anti-anti-reflection coating. So as we get farther away from green, it gets worse and worse until it's actually adding to the uh, reflection. So at green, we have a 0% reflection, but at some other wavelength, 1.5 wavelengths away, we'll actually have a 10% reflection. Now, lucky for us, the visual spectrum is narrow enough where we can cover it pretty fully with just one or two coatings. But this means that forever, there will be 
good spots and bad spots throughout the frequency spectrum. And so I, I really had a great time learning about all of the connections between frequency, spectral, and time and everything. For the grand finale, what if we had a coating where we could control the index of refraction at any depth? So if this is our glass layer and this is our coating, what if we had, you know, high and then low and then high and then low and then high? Then our graph over here would look sinusoidal. So instead of having a sudden step change where there's a change here, it's smoothly changing throughout. This is called a Rugate filter. It doesn't have to be a sine wave, by the way, but it often is. And if we take the Fourier transform of that sine wave, we end up with something that actually looks like this, where we have all of the energy at one color, at one wavelength. Now there's a couple of interesting quirks here. Uh, the start and stop, this, this is not infinite. We actually do have a starting and a stopping point, which means that there'll be not a perfect, uh, not a perfect concentration of energy in one wavelength. There'll be side lobes. And there's all kinds of details to go into where the, the proper waveform actually has tapered um, starting and stopping points so that we don't end up with the side lobes and so on. But the cool thing is that we can produce this very, very easily with this silicon etching technique. So let's move over to the uh, electrochemical side of the workshop and talk about this etching process. There are quite a few different kinds of silicon wafer in the world. And the ones that work best for this experiment are P-type that are heavily doped. And that's not a Cheech and Chong reference, that just means that these are very electrically conductive. So silicon by itself is not a very good electrical conductor, but if you add something else to it, you can actually make it you know, relatively good in terms of conductivity. And for this experiment, you want the most conductive ones you can find. So these are uh, about 0 0.01 ohm centimeters, heavily doped. The P-type wafers are generally not photosensitive, so you can etch these in kind of whatever conditions you've got. The N-type wafers are photosensitive, which could be interesting if you wanted to pattern this, but it still adds another wrinkle of difficulty, and I think you might actually have trouble getting enough illumination on there to build a uh, filter the way you want. But anyway, the other things like the the thickness of the wafer and the, you know, the crystallographic orientation and everything else don't really matter that much as near as I can tell. I characterized a whole bunch of wafers by running a voltage sweep with this Keithley 2450 and recorded the currents at different voltages spanning from, you know, negative 20 to plus 20 volts. And the wafers that work really well have a very sharp response, so we can get a lot of current through them at a relatively low voltage. For this etching process, we want to shoot for between 10 and 100 milliamps per square centimeter of etching surface. So to get that much current through the wafer, we want it to have a pretty sharp curve. These wafers that are very gentle in their VI curves are tough to work with because we need to force, you know, 50 or 100 volts through them to get enough current. And by that time, we have way too much power being dissipated and causes all kinds of other problems. So as near as I can tell, the heavily doped ones are the only ones that work reliably. This is an N-type wafer that I etched with a ultraviolet light shining down onto it. And the electrode that I was using at the time was this curly piece of wire that I was holding right over the top of the wafer. And if we look at the reflection, you can actually see the shadow of this wire is etched into the surface. So only the parts that were getting ultraviolet light shined on it were etching and the shadowed areas were left alone. Here's the setup that ended up working pretty well for me. The hot plate isn't really necessary, but it's just so cold out here in my shop that I need a hot plate to get back up the room temperature for any sort of consistency. And then I've got a really heavy steel plate here on top of the hot plate. And so we put the wafer on top of that and connect the, the steel part to the positive uh, part of the power supply. And we just rely on the, the physical contact of the wafer bottom with the plate to make contact. As it turns out, this particular variety of wafer that I bought came with an oxide coating on the backside, and I had to get rid of that because that was a really good insulator. And I found the best way to get rid of that coating was to just use the etchant that I used in this electrochemical process without any electricity, just spread it on there and let it sit for a minute or two, and it actually blows away that oxide coating. And you can test this by just taking a digital multimeter and just sticking the probes on there. If you just, you know, centimeter apart, you should be getting something like hundreds of ohms or less. If you get 
kilo ohms or mega ohms, that's, that's, there's an oxide coating that's blocking it for sure. So we put the wafer there, and then for the actual etched cell, I came up with this little uh, Teflon sort of flange piece with a nitrile O-ring in there. I just machined these parts on the lathe. I happen to have a, a Teflon tube of about the right dimensions. And so we put this on the part of the uh, wafer that we want to etch. And then I use the magnet from the old speaker and it slips down over this uh, Teflon part and the magnet is attracted to this big steel plate and puts just enough pressure on that O-ring to make a seal. So now we have a little liquid chamber that's sealed down to the uh, wafer surface. And then I machined a part out of stainless steel and spot welded this very thin stainless steel grid to it. And this goes down through the top like this. And the purpose of spending all this time and effort making uh, a stainless steel electrode instead of the coil of wire that you saw is so that the field is super, super parallel and even. So when this thing is uh, you know, supported by the Teflon ledge, the, it's very parallel to the surface of the wafer and the entire wafer is electrically connected to the steel plate, which is connected to here. So everything that, uh, at any point in there, the field is the same. It's very, very consistent. And then to connect this up, we just pinch on like that, and there's our circuit. I fill up the etch cell with this pipette, with a pipetter, and it takes about 8 ml of etchant. And the etchant that we're using is 50% ethanol and 50% hydrofluoric acid, everyone's favorite. And the acid itself is 50% HF. So of course, it's a very dangerous chemical. Uh, the real harm is that it can poison you without causing any immediate pain. So if this is your first time hearing about hydrofluoric acid, uh, you're probably going to want to research chemical safety quite extensively before thinking about using this. It really is a pretty nasty chemical. Once the etch cell is set up, we head over to the computer and use the Keithley script builder to download this waveform into uh, the source measurement unit and then uh, hit go and it will pr pr provide the current waveform into the etch cell and away it goes. Now you don't have to use a fancy Keithley SMU to do this. Uh, you do need current control though. The thing that controls the optical index in this etching process is the amount of current going through the silicon wafer per uh, square area. So having a voltage controlled supply isn't gonna help you. You really do need current control, but let me show you a quick way to do that. Here's a quick and dirty programmable current supply that you can use. Get yourself a microcontroller, I like to use Teensy's, and then use the PWM or DAC output, smooth it out with a low pass filter, and then use a voltage divider to get that voltage pretty low. So if the full swing output is 3.3 volts, maybe use a three to one or a five to one voltage divider to bring that down under a volt, and then feed it into an op amp that is driving a pass transistor and then you put a low value resistor over here, like maybe an ohm or less, and feed that into the negative input. And then the etch cell is connected between these two points. And then plus V is about, you know, five or 10 volts or something, if you have a highly doped P type wafer. And the idea here is that whenever there's one volt across this resistor, that means one amp must be flowing through here. So if you have one volt here and a one ohm resistor, then one amp will be flowing through here. And that's about right. Those are in fact the, almost exactly the right numbers that you want for, um, for this thing. You could use a smaller value resistor here too if you didn't want to lose quite as much power in there. So we actually haven't talked about why this actually works. You know, when we're etching the material here, it's not just getting rid of the top layer. What's actually happening is it's making the silicon porous. So we're going from a solid material, silicon, and the more current that we put through it, the more porous it gets until it's almost not even there at all. If we turn up the current high enough, the porosity goes up to essentially 100% and the whole layer pops off the surface, which is how we can separate these filters by using a high current pulse after, it's, after we're done making the filter. Um, the clever thing is that once a layer is etched, it, be, it no longer participates in the etching process. And I think the reason for this is that the charge carriers, the things that actually make the silicon conductive, migrate to the surface of these pores and then get used up. I mean, they basically get dissolved away or pushed further into the silicon or something. But the point is that, you know, if this is a chunk of silicon, if we start etching at the top, 
with a high current, we get high porosity there. And then as we're etching down through the silicon, if we lower the current, now we get low porosity down here, but it doesn't affect what we've already done. So we can change the porosity up and down as we're etching down through the material, and we can control it at pretty much any height. Now there's a couple things you have to worry about. The etchant itself can dissolve the silicon even without electricity. So if your etching process goes for a long time, yeah, that'll hurt your thing. And there's limits to how high and low the porosity can be. But I think we can change the index all the way from pretty close to one, all the way up to, you know, two point something. So we actually have uh, the ability to make really good optical filters because we have so much control over the index. So I mentioned the chemical sensitivity of these coatings. So check this out. If we just use a little distilled water and put a droplet on there, you know, not much really happens. But if we put a drop of isopropanol on there, watch this. Pretty dramatic color change. That's so cool. Now, to be fair, I think what's happening here is it's just a surface tension effect where the alcohol is able to soak into the filter and change its optical properties because it is porous whereas the water is hydrophobic, I mean, the surface is hydrophobic, and so the water doesn't actually soak down into the pores, and thus it can't change the filter. But um, it does mean that if you coat the filter with something functional, when something does attach to the surface, it will change optical properties, and you can use it as a sensor. As it happens, this particular filter is the only one I've made that has such a strong sensitivity towards alcohol being put on it in terms of color change, so I actually don't know exactly why some are sensitive and some aren't. Open question. Let's take some measurements from the wafer itself. Here's the setup where I have an incandescent desk lamp facing down into the wafer, and then the optical fiber, which is the input to the spectrometer, is aiming at about the same angle into the wafer. And then as I move the wafer around, we'll be able to pick one of the filters to inspect. And then I'll also set up the spectrometer to read off in percent so we can see how good or bad the filter is relative to just the plain old uh, silicon wafer. So here's the percent reflect from the green filter. And notice that the spike is above 100% because the filter is actually a better reflector of green light than the silicon wafer is itself. Same for the red filter, even more uh, effective in terms of reflectivity. And I should point out that uh, silicon, porous silicon is not a perfect optical material. It actually absorbs a lot more blue light than it does red light. So it's actually difficult to make a blue rugate filter, even though it's still possible. It's not as efficient because the silicon is in fact absorbing some of the light. So unlike the theoretical discussion earlier, yeah, if your layer is absorbing certain wavelengths, obviously that's gonna uh, destroy the energy, convert it into thermal energy. It's not gonna be perfect. But this last one I wanna take a look at, it's yellow, but it's actually a combination of green and red light. And we can see that there's a lot of side lobes and a lot of noise in there because I haven't so-called apodized my uh, waveform that I put in there. It's just a, a bang on and off square wave. But what's cool is that you can see the definite peaks there. And this was composed of two sine waves uh, mixed together, I mean, added together. And then we end up with this really cool interference pattern that ends up being a yellow filter. Pretty neat. And then finally, to detach the filter from the silicon wafer, if we want to make a transmissive filter, you basically just crank the current up pretty high to the, until the porosity is 100%, and then it detaches itself from the wafer, although it doesn't come off in one piece because it's so thin and delicate. It's kind of bursting with flavor there. Then I kind of cut it and float it off with alcohol. But you do end up with um, this really high-tech looking, really nice glitter. And you can see through it. Like I say, the silicon is a bit more absorptive in the blue and green light, so it's kind of reddish brownish. In fact, it doesn't transmit very well at all. But you can still see through it, and for infrared, these would make really great filters. So anyway, there's even more we haven't touched upon. For example, porous silicon is also a light emitter and a light sensor. So not only can we create these complicated filters, but we also can produce light emitting structures all in one stack up on silicon. It's really quite something. So I, I might do a video in the future on it. As always, please put questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. And if I got anything wrong, please correct me. And of course, I'll put that in the description as well. Okay, hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.